Welcome to the Limitless Energy Podcast. And we are here today in Reno, Nevada, in the Discovery Museum. And my guest today is Patrick Turner, Chief Advancement Officer of the Discovery Museum. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, this is a, uh, it's an important place for me because I have wonderful memories here. <laughs> I, I brought my kids here um, over the last decade when, when they were little. And I remember walking around here very tired, trying, <laughs> <laughs> trying to follow you know, toddlers around. Sure. Um, so I do want to make this distinction, though. It's good. The Discovery Museum is not a children's museum. It's, it's, a, it's a science museum. Exactly. Can you explain That's the important. distinction to me? Yeah. So when the museum, or when fundraising for the museum began in 2004, all the way until we opened in 2011, the idea was to be a children's museum here in Reno, Nevada. When our current president and CEO, Matt Sinclair, joined in 2013, part of um, the interview process with him, he, he presented to the board the idea that why should we be a children's museum in a market that doesn't have a science museum? So everything we've done since he joined was designed, or it has been designed to convert the experience here into more of a science museum. And the reason that's important is a children's museum um, by definition, serves families with kids about 12 and under. A science museum can serve everybody cradle to grave with science learning. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, being a lifelong learner is important. So when you're a science museum in a community this size, you can, there's a lot of potential for who you can serve in terms of you know, being cradle to grave learning opportunities. So sure, it's an yeah. important distinction for us. It's also a challenging one because when you fundraise for a project for six and a half years and everyone understands that you're going to be a children's, children's museum, um, it's, it's kind of a tough transition for people to remember. So we do our best to try and convince people that, you know, you don't have to have kids or be a kid to come to the discovery and have, have fun learning. Well, the presence of a science museum here in Reno really gives this, the city distinction, right? Exactly. I mean, it's kind of, you've got the Exploratorium in San Francisco, sure. and you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, we had the Franklin Institute, and oh, I, I, I grew up place. going to these. Yeah. And uh, how, does, how does the Discovery Museum fit in the context, you know, the Smithsonian and then all these famous science museums sure. in the national? Well, you draw the connection to the Exploratorium in San Francisco or the Franklin Institute, that's what we want people to equate us to. This is. This is an all ages science exploration experience. You don't have to be a young learner to come here. Um, even if you're a 40 something with no kids, we want you to be able to come here and have a fun learning experience. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible when we have conversations with people. There's one conversation I, I had with someone from San Francisco at one point a while ago. They left a comment card actually and said they really love the discovery they wish that they had something like this where they came from. And so I followed up by email and I said, I really appreciate your comment, thanks so much. Where, where do you come from? Where do you live that you wish you had a museum like this? And the woman replied, oh, I live in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow, thanks for the compliment, that's incredible, but did you know about the Cal Academy? Did you know about uh -huh. the Exploratorium? And she did, she just was really appreciative of, of the experience here, the size of the museum. And I think mm -hmm. she was surprised that a, a, a town like Reno has a, a museum this size. Mm -hmm. Well, this one is also particularly hands-on. Is is it more hands-on than than the, the bigger ones? I think no. I think we're we're on par in terms of the the level of interactivity here. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you go to the Exploratorium, there's very few things that you can't touch, um, and that's 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 what we're striving for as well. Mm -hmm. We want people to be able to experience the learning, not just read some text or see a video or anything like that. But it evolves. There's activities here. There, there's oh, yeah. structured activities. You sure. Know, so, um, yeah. you know, certainly there's a lot of continual thought and innovation that goes into developing what, right. what you guys present here. What, what's your involvement in that? Uh, so as chief advancement officer, I oversee our marketing, but then I also sort of help coordinate our fundraising team as well so that those two things happen in concert. Um, the, like I said, the biggest challenge is helping people understand that um, when they're supporting the discovery, they're supporting science learning uh, for the entire community, not just for young families. So that uh, it's certainly a challenge for me, but it's a challenge for our fundraising team too, to be able to convince people um, the need for support, not just for programming or camps or things like that for young kids, but also f for adults as well. And we have a lot of programming for adults here. So ultimately the mission of the Discovery Museum is, is more than just 
teaching science? Because I know that you know over the years you've had a lot of um, exhibits. You had exhibits involving history. You have now you've got an exhibit with uh, with mental health, right. mental health focus. It really is more than science, right? It's mm -hmm. it's nurturing and and. Uh, helping kids mature in addition to having this STEM component. Huh? Right. Yeah, no, our mission is, is simply to inspire. We want mm -hmm. people to come here and have a, a really fun learning experience that inspires them to, to look further into whatever interests them. So um, one of my favorite stories is a kid named Josh who came through our camp program a while ago. Uh, he, at the, at the time that he started camps, which was, gosh, now probably seven or eight years ago, he was struggling a little bit in school, didn't really have a passion for learning, um, but came here as a camper and through the course of two weeks of our science camps, di uh, discovered a love of science and actually ended up changing his performance in school because of that and really finding a science focus. And he's carried that on into uh, his young adulthood now. So those are, the, those are the stories we love to hear, the people that come here and find a love of science and then turn that into some sort of actionable you know, career path or just sort of passion that they they research further. There must be so many of those stories. There are. It's not always easy to corral them because uh -huh. people, you know, people grow up and they move on and it's not easy to track. But usually through our camp program where we have kids here on a, you know, for a full week or multiple weeks throughout the summer, we can have longer conversations with the parents or with the kids and, and really determine, you know, did you find a love here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, you've been around long enough now that you have kids that grew up in this and are yep. now in, in college or exactly. older, and you yep. have them come back. And My kids are, are examples of that, yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. well, mine too. You yeah. know, actually, they're, you know, when I, when I told them I was doing this, they were pretty excited. So, <laughs> uh, uh, well, now you'll have to bring them back. I, I, I will definitely bring them back because, you know, I do remember as I was walking around uh, as a parent, I... I was pretty hands-on sure. on the, all the all the toys and equipment and everything. There was, there's some fun stuff going on. <laughs> those puzzles that you had back there, oh. I couldn't figure those oh, yeah. out. Yeah, you know? the brain teasers are yeah, tough. Yeah. And there's no <laughs> better example for a young learner than seeing an adult learner who they already have a connection with being passionate about learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. I tried to model that for my kids, and hopefully I did that, you know, our role as parents isn't to come here and watch the younger kids learn. Our role is to learn with them and show them that a passion for learning is something that carries on well beyond childhood. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the things that I would get excited as a parent going and seeing an exhibit and being able to, mm -hmm. to explain it to my kids. Sure. And, uh, you know, yeah. good memories. You know, that's yeah. why something like this is so important for a community. Yeah, How definitely. involved are you with the local education system, with the county, in terms of promoting STEM in general? So our school field trip program is one of our biggest. We usually see on an annual, or on a school year basis, we see about half of the school district through our doors. Uh, that's a number that we've always, always strived to grow because um, everything that we do in our school field trip program is tied to the standards that the teachers um, teach to. So if a first grade class is doing something related to um, science, for example, there are standards that they have to adhere to in terms of what they're teaching those students. Our field trip program is directly connected to that so that when the students come to the museum on a field trip, there's a, there are pre and post activities that we provide to the teachers so that they can kind of start the field trip in the classroom before they get here and then continue it afterwards. But what they do while they're here is directly connected to what they're learning in the classroom so that it, it all works together with what the school district is doing. Um, the challenge for us for a while with our school or with our field trip program was transportation. Uh, I'm sure uh, folks are aware that you know, when the pandemic, or when we came out of the pandemic, jobs were not easy to fill, and so the school buses were hard to come by for us. Um, but that seems to be um, a thing of the past now, so we're, we're seeing our school district, our field trip numbers climb back up again. And Great. It's, it's an important program. Tell me about your outreach program. So that's new to us. Um, we actually received funding a few years ago to do a feasibility study. Um, we wanted to, before we launched that program, we wanted to make absolutely certain that we were going to design the program um, to the needs of the communities that we would serve. And we knew 
just based on our geography that we were going to need to serve a pretty wide area. There's a lot of Nevada to the east of us and a lot of smaller rural communities to our north and east. And so uh, it was important for us to, to make sure that we were going to design a program that was going to work with what those communities needed. Um, the feasibility study, we got those results. We've designed now the curriculum and launched the program. We have a van, we have a de de dedicated educator mm -hmm. um, who's already going out into the community. Um, but it's, it's a growing program and we're really excited to get that thing off the ground so that we can serve um, not just schools, but community centers. If, if, if a local city council wanted to bring the discovery to their small town, we can do um, science assembly programs where we get a large audience and we do sort of a stage show um, around science to, to generate that interest. Or we have classroom programs. Um, and probably one of the most popular uh, parts of the outreach program is our in, uh, portable planetarium. It's actually a big inflatable planetarium that can seat about 30 adults or 40 kids. Um, but it's, it's a planetarium experience like you would see at a planetarium or you know at a fixed planetarium um, just on a portable scale just a big inflatable dome yep exactly That's with a really great projector inside and a little sound system so you can hear narrated star shows or really any science content can be projected in there on, mm -hmm. on the inside of the dome that's awesome yeah it's really <laughs> cool <laughs> um yeah so i would imagine um you know it costs a little bit to get in here. There's some admission fee. Sure, yeah. Um, but you must get a lot of support from the from the state, from the federal government. What's that mix? Like? Uh, we actually don't get a ton of support from really? the state or the federal government. We don't, we're not of a size yet where we can apply for much federal funding. Um, state funding that we get usually comes through other partnerships, mm -hmm. um, like for educational programming. Predominantly, the, the support, the philanthropic support we get comes from corporations like Dragonfly Energy uh, and from foundations. Um, we see a lot of foundation support for people who are passionate about STEM education. And, mm -hmm. and so um, we've built a long list of folks who we go back to on a regular basis and ask for support. Mm -hmm. And well, then, of course, you know, things like admission and, and other paid programs help support the organization as well. There must be at least some recognition of the importance of the, the local science museum in raising, uh, the, you know, the visibility of, of STEM and, and sure. exposing. Kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, the, we definitely see um, great support for what the discovery does in terms of putting Reno on the map as a community that has a science museum. It's the other story I hear about a lot from people who migrate to Reno either for work or you know for retirement or whatever. Um, when they first learn about the discovery, they're always shocked at, that a town you know, this size, which feels small when you come from like the Bay Area or San Jose or a larger metropolitan area, has a science museum as, as big as this one. And it's part of that is driven by the building that we inhabit. This used to be Reno City Hall. So we kind of stepped into 67,000 square feet where a museum that's only 12 years old as we are would normally smart or be much smaller because they typically start in, you know, some prefab concrete building and build a following and build levels of support and then matriculate into something you know larger a pre-existing building or build their own building through a capital campaign or something like that but city hall this building became available because city hall or uh, the city of reno moved out of it and so we put on put in a bid and we're uh, happy happy to take over the space well i can speak from experience it was uh, it gave me a le level of comfort when I moved my family with sure. two small kids mm -hmm. from Southern California to Reno. Okay. Yeah. And it's like, okay, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a discovery museum. There's a right. science museum. We got a Trader Joe's. I think we're going to be okay. You know? <laughs> That's right. All the landmarks, <laughs> all the amenities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this town has actually more in the way of museums than I think people realize. We have a really great automobile museum. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have an incredible museum of art, and then with the discovery, it's sort of like this neat little trifecta of, of museums. Yeah, agreed. No, it's, it's an important part of the community, and uh, you, know, you guys do important work. What is it for you on, on a personal level? Your background is in marketing. Sure. And, and did you ever see yourself being a proponent of you know, science education and 
technology? Probably not initially. I mean, when I worked for the agency that I worked for before I came here, I certainly didn't really have a passion for science, but the reason I ended up here on a personal level is because um, when the museum was about ready to open at that time, let's see, my daughter was six and my son was just born and I really wanted to see this project through to fruition after having you know spent six years of my life in the agency world helping with the fundraising and so it made sense to make the jump from for-profit to non-profit and help this project um, open up its doors in 2011, September 2011. Uh, but definitely over the course of the last 12 years working here I've really become uh, passionate about science and science learning and science communication and I think that that's uh, that's what keeps me here is is hearing the stories like we've talked about of people who come here and they 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 learn about science and and develop a passion for it and it translates into career paths mm -hmm. well you've evolved to grow into this role <laughs> it sounds like how has the, the museum itself evolved over time and where do you see it going in the future uh, so uh, over time, like we talked about the evolution from a children's museum to a science museum through right. the exhibits that we host and through the programs that we offer, that's been a pretty drastic transition, but one that's, I think, served our community really well. Long term, I think we're going to probably grow out of this building. I think we're going to either have to add square footage somehow or look at a new location, possibly. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we're... Um, really passionate about though is the location being so close to downtown and being so close to the other two major museums it is a great location yeah we don't want to leave that behind because this this sort of central location has a lot of benefits to our community in terms of accessibility mm -hmm. and so um, if we can stay where we are and just grow the footprint that would be amazing right well the, when the museum started this was a casino town right <laughs> exactly now it's a, yeah kind of a tech hub. Right? Yeah, exactly. There's There's been a huge change in industry in this town, and um, it just seems like it's going to continue. I mean, there's so many benefits to being a tech business and coming to northern Nevada, and mm -hmm. so we want to be here. We want to be, like you said, you, we want to be that, that museum that people are surprised by when they move here, but then totally comfortable with once they're settled, because it feels like, oh yeah, this is the science museum just like I had when I lived in Northern California or Southern California or wherever that might be. Right. Yeah. Well, I think in the past it would have been, it was surprising to those of us <laughs> that moved in. I don't think it is anymore. I think, I think Reno has grown to deserve yeah. the museum that oh, it has now. Thank you very so. much. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think um, it's less surprising to people now that um, because of the way Reno has changed, I think they expect amenities like this one when they move here. Right. Well, great. Um, keep up the good work that you're doing. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate your time, and thank yeah. you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This has been really fun. Thanks for listening to the Limitless Energy Podcast, and be sure to subscribe on any of your favorite podcast platforms.